Um, next week, um, you, I'm going to be handing out on Monday the review for the final exam. Okay. So you want to make sure that you get that because those aren't in class. And we are having lab next week. Yes. Are, are our lab notebooks due the day of finals? Yes. Yes, and so the way that it generally works is I'm up here and you turn them in and I try to grade them before you leave. Okay. So then you can pick it up after you're done with the final exam. All right. Okay. That generally works okay. So you can use your lab notebooks to study um, for the um, final exam. Okay, so we were talking about some lines of evidence that Darwin was using to develop his idea about how species change. And one that I didn't mention um, was embryonic development. And so he was really fascinated specifically about the embryonic development in vertebrates, which are organisms that have a backbone. So if we look at um, an image of a, let's see if this is going to work today reason okay so this is just a diagram that shows how early embryonic development in vertebrates is very similar and then how as we um, uh, go through and develop then we start to see some differences between say for example fish and chickens and um, humans for example and it's just a okay so um, we watched a video that talked about how we share many of the same genes. Um, so we have many of the same genes that say fish have, and we have many of the same genes that birds have, and many of the same genes that turtles have. So what determines the differences in embryonic development? Do you remember what that video um, hypothesized about that? So it was a video that was looking at genes and how we only have 21 or maybe 20,000 different genes and how our genetic material is very similar to other species. So we're doing more with less and we're doing exactly the same number. <laughs> right, they actually have some, in some cases, have more genes than we do. So the idea is, is that we share some of the same genes as the other organisms, lots of them, actually. If you think about hemoglobin, for example, all except for those ice fish have hemoglobin. So when we look at embryonic development, it actually has to do with the differences, has to do with gene regulation. So the differences between, for example, vertebrates, and we could actually look at even some um, invertebrate species, but the differences between vertebrates um, has to do with how the genes are regulated. So that means how they're turned on and off. So for example, humans share many of the same genes with other species. So it's not that we have unique genes, but it's how that we use those genes determines the difference. Okay. So of course, um, Darwin did not know about that. Remember, he was um, working at a time when we didn't even know what the DNA, what the genetic material was. So he didn't have that evidence. But that explains why we appear so similar early on. And then as we develop, we differentiate. And so a good example of this early embryonic development that he looked at in vertebrates was limb development. Right? And so we can actually see when we look at the um, forelimb, for example, so the forearm, we can actually see that the forearm shares the same bones no matter what um, organisms we're looking at, but it's how those bones grow, whether they lengthen or whether they stay short, they change shape. So the bones change shape. During embryonic developments. 
And this gives us, say, for example, a wing versus a flipper versus an arm. Okay, so it's the same genes that cause the development of those four arms, but it's how the genes are regulated that determine the difference. So it's not like we have an arm gene and a bird and a bird has a wing gene. It's the same gene that causes this development, but it's how it is regulated. Okay, so when we look at these structures, we can talk about homologous structures. And when we talk about homologous, homologous means same. So remember we talked about homologous, um, well actually we talked about homozygous, right? So this means same. So these are structures that have the same embryonic origin. And um, because they have the same embryonic origin, we believe that they also have the same evolutionary origin. So if we look at a vertebrate early on evolving, right, we say that the um, limb of a, um, of a horse, for example, would be homologous to the flipper of a whale. Okay. So when we look at a diagram that shows this homology, okay, so here the bones are colored differently. So notice that we all have a humerus, right? But in a horse, that forearm, that humerus stays short. And then the radius and the ulna, right, develop. And then obviously the um, horses are standing up on their toes compared to some other organisms like black and cats stand up on their toes as well. But they have a single toe. We kind of looked at that evolution of horses um, earlier. So this horse limb is homologous to the flipper of a whale. The flipper of the whale would be homologous to the wing of a bat, okay, or the wing of a bird, okay? So that would be homology. Now we can also talk about analogy, okay? So homologous structures. So an example of this would be the flipper of a whale and the wing of a bat, right? Notice how these are similar evolutionarily and have embryonic origins similar, but they um, do not have the same function, right? So when structures have the same function, they're said to be analogous. So analogous structures have the same function, but not necessarily the same embryonic origin. So same function not necessarily the same embryonic origin. They could be both analogous and homologous. So for example, you could say the wing of a bird and the wing of the bat are both homologous because it's a modification of the forearm and they're analogous because they allow them to fly. But if we look at some other organisms that have wings, if you look at, say, for example, a butterfly wing, butterflies did not modify one of their walking legs to become a wing. So they have six legs like every other insect. And so their wings are not derived from their limbs, but rather they're just a kind of an outgrowth of the back of their body. So you could almost think of butterfly wings as being more like angel wings, where it would be. Because angel wings, we still have our, you know, angels would still have their, they're not, you know, necessarily, okay, but angels would still have their arms, right? The wings would come out the back, right? So a butterfly wing and a bird wing, right? They would um, be analogous, but they would not be homologous, okay? Does everybody understand that idea? The difference between homologous and analogous. Okay. Okay, so let's look at some examples of adaptations. So adaptations are any trait that increases the probability that an organism will survive and reproduce.
So any trait, trait means that it could be anatomical, right? So it could be like flippers would be an adaptation that would allow, say, for example, penguins to swim, but a not very good adaptation to allow them to fly, right? But they've modified their wings so that they swim with them instead of flying with them. So we could have anatomical, so this would be like a structure, right? We could also have physiological. So this could be going on something inside the body, right? And so we've actually looked at some examples of physiological adaptations. So for example, the lack of hemoglobin in ice fish would be a physiological adaptation as would be the persistence of lactase in some human populations. Okay. We could also look at anatomical and physiological in organs, right? So fish have different kidneys than, say, for example, mammals. And the mammals have physiological adaptation that might allow them to conserve water, whereas a freshwater fish wouldn't, right? So it could be anatomical inside. So it could be your kidney, it could be the four-chambered heart versus a two-chambered heart, right? Or it could be physiological. So it could be like, what is going on? How does it work, okay? Another example would be behavioral. And so this is important because behavioral behaviors are actually thought to have a genetic basis. And so this would be, for example, um, suckling behavior in newborns is an example of an adaptation. They know how to latch onto a nipple and they know how to suckle. So that would be an example of a behavioral trait that is believed to be genetic, okay? We also have um, examples of, in this case, um, plasticity is even an adaptation. So plasticity is the ability to change your behavior Um, in response to the environment. Right? So we have plasticity, and that is an adaptation. So we can learn, right? Whereas when you look at some organisms like some birds, some birds, um, a really interesting example of a behavioral adaptation would be bird song. So some birds are born knowing how to sing their song. They're also born knowing how to migrate, right? Some birds actually learn their song from their parents. And that can be good or bad because in birds, there is a window of opportunity for them to learn the right song. And if they learn the wrong song, then they're stuck singing the wrong song for the rest of their life. And they're very unlikely to reproduce because if you're a male bird, you're singing the wrong species song, you're not going to attract the females, right? And so um, that would be um, an example of a behavioral adaptation, like a good example would be bird song. Okay. Okay. So there's lots of really interesting adaptations, one of which um, is um, uh, adaptation in kangaroos. One of the interesting things about kangaroos is like dogs, they cannot sweat. So they do not have sweat glands. And if you think about Australia, it can be very hot. The way that they actually are able to cool themselves is, is that they have a patch of furless skin on their forearms. And so there's lots of blood vessels that go to that patch of skin. And so in order to cool themselves, they lick their forearms, right? So this is what that fever is doing. So they lick their forearms and tell us it's like sopping wet with saliva. And then blood goes to the forearm and then heat is radiated out and taken away as the saliva evaporates off that patch of skin. So that would be an example of a kind of anatomical, physiological, behavioral combination and adaptation, right? So if they can survive extreme temperatures, then they're more likely to reproduce and pass those genes on to the next generation. So that behavioral adaptation, and it's also anatomical and physiological, would be um, uh, increase their likelihood of passing their genes on to the next generation, okay? 
Now there's another really interesting one. This is in vampire bats. And so vampire bats feed on blood. They go out at night and they try to find grazing animals that are maybe sleeping, like standing up like a cow um, or a deer. And what they do is, is that they sneak up on them. And sometimes they sneak up um, on, the, on the ground. Sometimes they fly and they land on the back of their necks so they have a hard time getting rid of them, right? And so what they do is they come up and they um, bite, but they have an anesthetic so that the animal does not feel it. And then they have an anticoagulant, so the blood just kind of flows out of the wound. And what they do is they use their tongue after they bite and they just lap up the blood. So the, um, that would be an adaptation, but um, and the, you know, producing an anesthetic and an anticoagulant would also be an adaptation. But one of the most interesting behavioral adaptations is, is that they regurgitate blood to one another. So when you go out, if you think about your bat, your chances of finding a prey animal might be very slim. And they have a very high metabolic rate. So when they come back to the roost, those that have been successful will regurgitate to those who were not successful. If they didn't do that, then there would be a die-off of individuals. So it's uh, an example of uh, what is called reciprocal altruism, where they have to cooperate because of the unlikelihood of feeding. And there's been evidence that shows that you had a cheater. So let's say you had somebody who fed but came back and didn't regurgitate. It seems that they can identify those individuals and then they would not be regurgitated to. So this behavior of regurgitating to one another would be an example of an adaptation but increases the likelihood that they would survive and pass their genes on. Because if they're a cheater, they wouldn't be able to survive and they wouldn't be able to pass their genes on. Okay. So those are just some examples of interesting adaptations. Okay. So adaptations come about because of natural selection. So we say that adaptation is the trait, the mechanism of getting adaptations is natural selection. So this is a mechanism of evolution <coughs> that produces adaptations. Okay. So um, when we look at um, natural selection, there are some assumptions that we make about what has to be present in order for natural selection to work. Okay. One is, is that there must be variation in the population. And this variation comes about through random mutations. So variation is produced. through random mutations. And we talked about how we can even have spontaneous mutations, which is just due to the inherent, inherent instability of the DNA basis, right? Sometimes they'll just pair incorrectly, right? And then, so that variation is really important, okay? Now, it's important to realize that these are mutations are random, that natural selection is not random. Right? So natural selection selects for the variation that is already present, okay? And that'll be important. The second thing that has to happen is, is that you have to have more individuals produced, or one of the assumptions is, is that more individuals, oops, more individuals are produced than can possibly survive and reproduce. And you can think of this really simply when you think about insects, because if you think about um, mosquitoes, right? If you think about, they just lay huge amounts of egg, eggs into the water, and then only a few larvae actually survive. A lot of them get eaten, some of them die. And then those are the ones that survive. And so we can think of it really simply when we think about organisms that produce huge numbers of offspring. 
But even if you were talking about elephants, in the past, if elephants reproduced, and if every elephant that was born survived and reproduced, then you get what is, a, um, that would be a, an example of exponential growth. And so you would get, if every elephant that ever was born was able to survive and reproduce, we would have so many elephants, right? So there's natural competition between individuals um, that makes some of them um, more likely to survive. So we have competition, for example. I'll just put an example. We have competition for resources. Makes it likely that not all of them are going to survive and reproduce. Okay. Okay. The second or the third thing is is that oh I forgot I should probably put this a second but we'll put it down here that the variation is heritable so variation is heritable so what that means when you say it's heritable that's table here it bubble that means that it's passed from parent to offspring. Right. So if the variation was caused by the environment, it would not necessarily be heritable. Now, we now know about epigenetics, and so that's a little weird, like, kind of weird, you know, example of, you know, how variation that is caused by the environment could be passed down to your offspring. But when we were looking, um, when uh, Darwin was looking at this, he said that variation had to be passed from parent to offspring. So if the parent had a trait, it passed through that trait to the offspring. Okay, so that variation was heritable. Okay, so the example that I'm going to show you a video of is what is called rock pocket mice. And the rock pocket mice have variation in um, their coloration of their fur, and it is coded for by a gene that produces pigments. But again, that gene is regulated. So the gene can either be turned off or turned on. And so it really has to do with not variation in the gene, but variation in the switch that controls whether the gene is turned on or off. Okay, so I'll watch that video. It's about 15 minutes. And so this is an example of natural selection. And then it shows, it talks about natural selection in two separate populations and how they independently evolve to have um, this particular um, adaptation. Across the American Southwest, golden deserts dotted by cacti and brush stretch for miles. Yet here is Mexico's Valley of Fire. The landscape changes dramatically. Patches of black rock interrupt the sand, remnants of volcanic eruptions that occurred about 1,000 years ago. The eruption spewed a river of lava more than 40 miles long across the desert. As the molten rock cooled, it darkened, leaving any creature dependent upon camouflage in serious trouble. In the complex battle of life, one of the constant struggles between seeing and not being seen, the evolutionary game of hide and seek. And we've come here to the Valley of Fire in New Mexico, a battlefield to find one of the tiniest soldiers and what it can teach us about how evolution works. On the desert sands, the rock pocket mouse blends in perfectly, its light colored fur concealing it from predators. But on dark lava, the same fur makes the mouse stand out, tracking the many creatures that see it as food. Thank <laughs> you. 
these mice are the Snickers bar of the desert. They're eaten by foxes and, and coyotes and, and rattlesnakes, and certainly by owls, and maybe even occasionally hawks. And most of those predators are visual predators. You know, we have so what happened to the pocket mice that found themselves on this new terrain? When I accompanied biologist Michael Nachman onto the log, it doesn't take long to find out. Oh, this one's closed. Nachman has been collecting mice unharmed in traps. And it's a dark one. It is. Yeah. Now, are most of the ones you find up here dark? Almost all. It's not only have the mice here evolved to be as dark as the mushrooms, the color change has occurred precisely where it will conceal them from hunters. And a bit of a white underbelly, too. That's right. All of the dark ones here and around the lava flows have a white underbelly. Presumably, there's no selection for dark on the belly because predators are coming to the sun. Left to themselves, the mice show no preference for light or dark rocks. It's the predators that have made the difference. The change in color over evolutionary time of the population is driven by predators weeding out the mice that don't match their background. But how did the dark mice arise in the first place? And when a black mouse appears in a light population of mice, that is usually going to be due to a mutation. And those are random and rare events. To fully understand the pocket mouse transformation, Nachman moves from the lava to the lab. He and his team extract DNA from light and dark mice taken from one desert region. The aim? Find one or more genetic mutations that cause dark coloration. A mutation is a change in the chemical letters that make up our genes. It's a copying error that may occur when our cells divide. Mutation seems to mean that something bad has happened. Well, mutations are neither good or bad. Whether they are favored or whether they are rejected or whether they're just neutral depends upon the conditions an organism finds itself. So for the pocket mouse, a mutation that causes a mouse to turn black, that is good if you're living on black rock, and it's bad if you're living out in the sandy desert. The light mice are all on the bottom, here, here. Fur color is a trait controlled by many genes. To figure out how dark mice evolved, Nachman focuses on how these genes differ in dark and light mice. One by one, the genes prove identical. But at last, something does turn up. The difference between dark and light mice boils down to a difference of four chemical letters in a gene called MC1R. Because the gene controls the amount of dark pigment in a mouse's hair follicles, a mouse with these mutations grows dark fur, which gives it an advantage on a dark background. But still, that's one mouse. How would its dark fur spread to a whole population? This lava flow is about a thousand years old. And so you might wonder is, has there been enough time? It's only been a thousand years, it's a very short period of time for a new mutation to come along and spread so that all of the mice on this lava flow are black, because really they all are. Indeed, such a rapid spread of a mutation may seem unlikely until you do the math. And the reason is that while only one new mouse born in 100,000 may be black, Hundreds of thousands of mice are born in any given year. And then those mice that are black have enough advantage that their babies do better, and they have more offspring, and their offspring have more offspring. And just about a 5% advantage compounded year in and year out can very quickly turn the whole population black, as we see today. If dark color gives mice a 1% competitive advantage, and you start with 1% of the population being dark. In about 1,000 years, 95% of the mice will be dark. If instead, the dark color gives them a 10% advantage, then it only takes 100 years. Thanks to Nachman's mice, science has an example of evolution crystal clear in every detail. 
What's exciting about this is that we have a system that's very simple ecologically. You have dark rocks and you have light rocks and you have dark mice and light mice. It couldn't be simpler. We know who the predators are with the selective forces. We know precisely the genetic basis of what makes the mice have an advantage or a disadvantage depending upon where they live. All the pieces are finally together. It's a perfect illustration of Darwin's process of natural selection. In fact, it's more than that. For Nachman's mice also counter a common misconception that evolution is a random process. Well, there is one random component, and that's the process of mutation. Mutations occur random throughout our DNA. Every new organism is born with a new set of mutations. But while mutation is random, natural selection is not. Natural selection sorts out the winners and losers. That's really what the whole process of evolution is driven by. But if natural selection is not random, would it produce the same result under the same conditions? It does. And here's proof. Rock pocket mice collected by Nachman from other lava flows in other parts of the Southwest. These are two different black mice, and they each have all done different lava flows. And the lava flows are hundreds of miles apart. But the changes, the genetic changes that made these mice black uh, were different in each case. And what's amazing to me is how similar the black mice are. We didn't know when we started this whether we would find that there were the same genes or different genes. And, and we were really surprised to find that there were completely different genes. And yet, if you look at the mice, they look almost identical. Clearly, there are different genetic ways to make a mouse dark. But once the beneficial mutations appear, natural selection, a non-random part of evolution, can, under very similar conditions, favor very similar adaptations. In effect, each of these lava flows is like rewinding the tape of life and allowing evolution to occur again and again. In each case, we find the dark mice have evolved. The water pocket mice show us that evolution can and does repeat itself. And why evolutionary change is never ending. As environments transform, so must the species that inhabit them, adapting and readapting in the great and complex battle of life. Okay, so take a few minutes and um, <coughs> write down some notes about those rock pocket mice. So under rock pocket mice, what would you write? Okay. Remember, remembering that mutations are random, but selection is non-random, and that different lava flows actually have uh, mice with different mutations that give them the same phenotype, right? the same dark color. So the Mutation would be the in the genotype, but the phenotype is the dark coloration. Okay. Okay, so um, when we talk about natural selection, there's actually different kinds of natural selection. And so when we look at a trait in a population, it frequently shows what is referred to as a normal distribution. So this is a trait, and so this is um, the variation in the trait on this axis. Right? And this would be the number of individuals. So oftentimes we see a normal distribution like this. So if we were looking at size as a very as a trait, right? In humans, um, when we look at height or we look at size, most of the individuals are somewhere intermediate in size. So this would be increasing, right? And then this might be variation. So this would might be like size, we'll say. And this is number of individuals. So if I follow this over here, most of the individuals are intermediate in size, 
right? So we can affect that variation through different selection processes. And so the first one I want to talk about is what is referred to as directional selection. So this is where we select, right? So selection means those are the individuals that um, get to survive and reproduce. So we have selection for um, one extreme or the other. Right. So if we were looking at size as an example, it would be like selection for these individuals that are very large. Right. And so in the next generation, what we see is, is that the mean has shifted so that now the mean looks like this. So the average would be, and that's I should draw it more like the other one. So the average would be large, right? Instead of medium size, right? So we can select for one extreme. You could also select for small, right? One extreme or the other. But what happens is, is that you shift the average in the population. And that's why it's called directional, because you're going towards one extreme or the other. So it's a directional shift, okay? So an example of this that we've already kind of looked at is in horses. So if we look at the fossil record in horses, we see that in the fossil record, the ancestor to the modern day horse was small, right? And it also had multiple toes. And then as we look at the fossil history of horses, we see that they get bigger. So an increase in size of horses over evolutionary time would be an example of directional selection, right? You also see that there's lots of branches, right? In, and you can also see that there's species that have actually gone extinct. So these are like dead ends. The only one that survived to modern day um, is the modern horse. So that would be that top one up there. So the rest of them are no longer present, but they're present in the fossil record, but they're no longer around today. Okay. So that's actually an example of divergent evolution, where we have an ancestor that gave rise to multiple forms, and then when is the uh, was it the, able to survive to modern day? Okay. Oops. Okay, so that's directional. We can also have what is called stabilizing selection. And this is where we have selection for the mean. Right, so we have actually selection against the extreme. So instead of selection for the extremes, we have selection against the extremes. So selection for average, right, a medium. And a really good example of this is in birth weight. So in humans, babies have Oops. An average birth weight, okay. and it's about uh, three kilograms, or let's say maybe um, what is the average birth weight? Probably seven pounds. So we could do seven pounds, right? And so this would be human birth weight. Might be a little bit smaller than that, but okay. So male babies are born, you know, somewhere between six and eight pounds. The extreme here would be like two pounds, or not even have like one pound babies to be born, right? And then if the baby is too large, say the baby's 11 pounds, ordinarily it would not have survived because it would have killed the mother, because it would not be able to be born, right? And so what happens over time, if we didn't intervene, is we would select against these guys, right? We'd select against those guys. And what we would get is an average that becomes more closely centered. So we're decreased variation. So this is a decrease in the variation. So that we don't have babies that are being born one pound. We don't have babies that are born being born 11 pounds, right? So if we look at infant mortality, which would be the selection pressure in this particular instance, so notice how infant mortality 
right, is really high at anything that's under four pounds, right? And it's also really high, or it starts to get higher when you get above 10. So the average birth weight is about seven pounds right here, okay? And notice there's not a lot of variation so that it's a really um, tight normal distribution, okay? So what we would predict as we actually go in and um, modify the ability of babies to be um, born through C-sections and also through prenatal care. So now we have babies that are being born that are like, actually, I had a niece that was born, I think she might have been under two pounds. So they can survive now, right, through intervention. And then if they're too large, we give them a C-section, right? So what we would predict with human reproduction is, is that this is going to widen out a little bit. Because if you were born, say, at three pounds, that could be heritable variation. So you survived, you have a baby, and that baby is also small, right? If you were born really large, that could be heritable variation. But through a C-section, you could give birth to a large baby, right? So what we would expect to see with modern technology, medical technology, is, is that we're going to widen this out, right? So there's going to be more babies that are born small and large, because we're not selecting against that, those two extremes. Okay, so that is stabilizing selection. So the last example I want to talk about is what is called disruptive selection. And this is selection against the mean. So a selection against the mean. So not for the mean, as in stabilizing, but against the mean. Okay. So a good example of this occurs in Chinook salmon. And specifically, we're looking at male body size. Right. So this is body size. And we see that some males, so this would be again number of individuals, we see that some males um, are smaller than average and some males are really big, but very few males are intermediate in size. So we get this bimodal distribution that looks something like this. It's actually probably more of these than those, okay? So this means that we have males that are small and we have males that are large. Does anybody know what a smaller than, like a real small um, Chinook salmon is called? W3. It's a guy's name. Jack. Jack, yes. So this is a Jack salmon. So poor Jacks, right? <laughs> this is the Jack salmon, right? Okay, so they have a small, and so what they do is they go to the ocean, and they only spend like a year there, so they don't get very big, and then they come back and they want to spawn, right? These guys go out to the ocean and they spend years getting big, and then they come back and they want to breed, right? So why is it that some males come back early? There must be an advantage, right, a selective advantage. And so we can talk about the mating strategies, right? So there's two mating strategies. Okay, so large males compete for access to females. Small males, like jack salmon, use the sneaky male strategy. So they don't actually courtship, they don't actually try to guard the female, right? And so what happens is, is this large male has got a female and he's courting her, right? And the female lays her eggs because they have external fertilization. The sneaky male is watching the whole thing. And so what he does is he darts in, dumps his sperm, and then darts back out. Okay? So he doesn't have to be big because he's the sneaky male. Okay? If he was of medium size, like if he was larger, then that large male might say, oh, that's a male, I better chase him off, right? But they're, so, they're small, so he doesn't detect them as being somebody that they need to chase off. So small is good, 
and large is good, but intermediate size is bad. And so you get two distribution, bimodal distribution. Okay. So that is an example. Um, here's a picture of them. Okay. So this would be a normal size male. This would be the jack salmon. And I believe recently there was like way too many jack salmon in the Columbia River. Yeah. And so the question is, why are they becoming more prevalent? Because really, this strategy, this sneaker male strategy, notice how I put like there's fewer of them. Um, when you look at evolutionary models, if too many males become sneaky males, then this whole system collapse, collapses, right? So you can only have so many sneaky males because the females will release their eggs unless they get properly stimulated through courtship, right? So this, if you just had sneaky males, then this isn't going to work, okay? So there was concern that there were too many jack salmon in a population um, and not enough large salmon to actually do the mating. Okay. Okay. So let's look at some misconceptions. Um, and this is, there's some listed in your book as well. So this is misconceptions about natural selection and evolution. Okay. So one misconception is, is that humans evolved from chimpanzees. That's a misconception, right? Because both of these groups, both of these species are modern day, right? So this is a misconception. So what you would say instead, right, to, to understand this, is, is that humans and chimpanzees share a common ancestor. Chimpanzees have been evolving right along with us. So this is true, I'll put true. Right, okay. So a misconception is, is that we evolved from them. We have a common ancestor, as do actually all animals share a common ancestor. Okay, the other misconception is, is that organisms can mutate towards a goal. So the idea is, oh, there became black lava, so the um, mice just evolved to be black, right? So they mutated, and they got a mutation that meant that they were going to be black, right? And that is incorrect, because mutations are random. So we'd say true, oh, tr what's true is that mutations are random. And those random mutations could either be detrimental, so they could be selected against, they could be beneficial, they could be selected for, or they could just be neutral, right? So it could, there could be a neutral mutation that has no effect, okay? The second, or the third thing is, is that organisms evolve. So let's, let's, let's put individuals. Individuals evolve. So when we use the word evolve, like when we're talking about our personality, you know, we say sometimes we say, well, I have evolved, right? But really individuals do not evolve. So evolution only takes place in populations. So what is true is, is that populations evolve. And we'll talk more about that next week. So populations change. When we talk about individuals, individuals, um, can acclimate maybe, right? So we could say individuals right. So we could say like if you acclimated to an environment by being better able to um, stand heat or stand humidity. So if you like lived here and you decided you were going to move down to South America or to the tropics, you could acclimate to that, right? So you could develop better resistance and get used to it, but you would not have evolved to that, okay? Okay. Okay, and then what's the other one I want to say? I guess that's it. Those are the misconceptions. I think there's a few other ones in your book. I can't think of any more right now. 
Okay, so I'm actually going to stop there for today, and I have a few more quizzes. And we're going to start on population genetics, which we already kind of did um, a little bit in lab. Remember, there's no lab today. And I'm also going to hand out um, a review sheet for the final exam on Monday. So have a good Thanksgiving break. Don't forget to come back next week. <laughs> hey, when especially athletes, have please have a tendency to go about home for Thanksgiving and they do not return. <laughs> Thank you.